Today is because Steve couldn't get the machine to work properly. And that's because he's of an older generation and doesn't, doesn't understand this. Yeah. Okay, so he says he wants to stay, so we're just going to mock him for a few minutes. He's staying so, uh, sure it works. So we're talking about antibodies, which no, you know... Because I admire the way you yeah. Cause Antibodies, which you know everything about, because you've done all this stuff before, and I've seen your, um, your timetable for the course. So I don't have to worry about the immunology side either because Marcus Holker has covered that with you. But if I do say anything that you're not sure about, please wave your hands and I shall repeat or explain. So uh, basically, it used to be called D2D, beef, whatever that was. Uh, I haven't changed the name on there. But the thing is, there's a, it's a very heavy presentation. I think there's about 90 slides. I'm not going to go through 90 slides. All those slides have data on there and resources for you and quite a lot of front pages of papers with the, with the summary so you don't have to go down uh, into PubMed or the library or anything all these papers are on the presentation okay so they're there for your own resources so if you're particularly interested in uh, using a type of uh, monoclonal antibody in therapy all you have to do is uh, make sure that you uh, have a quick look at the paper find the authors and you can do some more reading yourself okay so because you're uh, master's students and not undergrads, I've, been, I've taken the liberty of giving you a lot of information um, which you can selectively use, okay? So when you come back from this lecture, instead of going to the pub tonight, you can sit at home with your laptops and go through the talk in, in great detail, which I'm sure you do. Anyway, if I saw this at the start of a lecture, I'd be thinking of reasons why I could leave and go out. Don't worry, some of these sections here are only one slide, but that's just to put everything in context, okay? So the first thing is a rapid review of mouse monoclonal antibodies. You'll have heard of how these are made, but basically all you do is immunize a mouse, take the spleen cells out. The spleen cells have got B cells in them. Thank you. I've got B cells in them, and those B cells make antibody, as you know. If you then hybridize those B cells to non-secreting T cells in a lymphoma cell, then you get a fusing of two cells together. One is an antibody-producing cell, one is a T cell that grows in culture forever, so one is immortal. You fuse the two together and you end up then with a hybrid cell which has got information to make antibody from the B cell and information to grow forever from the T cell and you put those together and they, they grow in culture after you've selected them and cloned them, it's quite a long saga, but you end up with individual B cell clones which are um, hybridomas and secrete antibody of exactly the same affinity, avidity, specificity, and everything, okay? So they are cloned cells that, se that secrete cloned antibodies. So they're exquisitely specific, and, and they grow forever in culture, and so they produce, they're a very good resource. Now, basically, the technology behind making these things, I'm sure has been described um, to you by other colleagues, but it's just, I just summarized it in one or two words here, and usually NS1 myeloma, which is the, uh, the mouse myeloma there, is usually the one that's used as the myeloma cells. So you have mouse spleen cells fused to NS1 myeloma, and they produce hybridomas. They select on drug resistance, which I'm not going to go into, but all I want to say to you is that unfused myeloma cells will die because of the culture medium. Unfused normal B cells die after two weeks or so, and so only hybridoma survive. Only the cells that are fusions of T cells for, that grow forever and B cells that make antibody, they're the only ones that survive, okay? Having done that then, you have quite a lot of uh, interest in, in what could happen <coughs> in the uh, application of these. So we're going to talk about antibodies made in mice and then antibodies made in mice that have been changed genetically or, or mutations have been made. But basically, if you're going to be working on a species, and, and you've heard from, from uh, earlier that I'm, I'm uh, from Steve, that I'm at the vet school here. I'm not a vet, but I've been working on um, diseases in, in animals, uh, particularly in, in horses. And when it comes to horses, there's absolutely no way you're going to get monoclonal antibodies that are specific for a horse virus if you make it in a mouse. So, so the question was, well, can we make heterohybridomas? And this will come up uh, in your future life if you stay in this area. If you're making monoclonal antibodies, you really want to make them from humans. 
You want human myeloma cells fused that make a monoclonal antibody, but there are very few of those myeloma cell lines around. There's even less myeloma cell lines around other species, so interspecies fusions are possible and indeed have been used, otherwise I won't tell you about them. And they're called heterohybridomas. And there's got one example here, and I don't want you to, to, to read into this many more than this, but just to say that this feature exists. And this is very valuable, by the way, if you were looking to make a monoclonal antibodies in species such as the bat, okay, and you wanted to make um, uh, coronavirus monoclonal antibodies in a host that was already harboring them, or in cats and dogs to have coronaviruses, so do chickens. So if you were interested in making antibodies that was from that species, then you can use this heterohybridoma approach. So what, what we did with um, horses was we took um, uh, normal horse uh, lymphocytes, and fuse them to mouse myeloma cells, and you produce then a, a non-antibody secreting hybridoma. So that grew in culture forever. So that was horse times mouse lymphoma that grew in culture. Then you fuse that to a B cell from a horse, and a het that becomes a heterohybridoma, and it makes antibody that the horse has seen. And as far as we're concerned, those antibodies are equine, they are horse antibodies, but they are monoclonal, okay? And there's a paper, see how long ago this was, this is 1992, this was even before you became interested in this area, and um, <clears throat> 1992 was ooh, about 50 years, 60 years after Steve got his PhD. <laughs> so we're going to do a quick historical perspective, because I've been asked to, just to put, put the immune system in, in, in context for you. There are lots, the immune system is very smart. And it's only smart because it's, uh, it learns what to do. Basically, your immune system's job is to um, uh, differentiate between normal and abnormal. That's all the immune system does. So if you're making antibodies against something in yourself or some other animal, is this against something that's not a normal cell? And so there's loads and loads of uh, old data on this. Uh, believe it or not, horses were used for making anti-tetanus antibodies about 100 years ago. Uh, you used to um, immunize horse against tetanus uh, and then uh, put the, the serum or the plasma into human beings that had tetanus. And if they didn't die of toxic shock, they, they survived. There's also antitoxins, of course, which you know about to, to protect you from being bitten by some nasty snake somewhere. Uh, intravenous injection of maternally derived antibodies. Um, for example, colostrum in many mammals contains antibody to local pathogens. That's why babies take these um, uh, take the colostrum. If you then um, use that to transfer into neonates, you can transfer antibody that way. And there's a few other strange systems that are in, in action which we're not going to go into, but particularly. Uh, in terms of HIV and multiple sclerosis, there is some, well, not a lot, but there's some benefit to using uh, immunized goat uh, serum proteins for that. So, see, that was easy. That was just one slide. Okay, so you, so you begin to think this is perhaps not a bad lecture after all. So, the concepts of immunotherapy, what are they about? Well, based on the body's natural defense system, which is immunity, immunotherapy can go in one or the other direction. You can either increase this immune response in this patient, and that's what you want to get rid of cancer, <clears throat> or indeed you can reduce the response, and that's what you want to do in patients who've got asthma. Now, I think you people here have probably done an awful lot with immunoglobulin E, IgE. You're probably sick to death of IgE, and you've done the tertiary structure, and you've done the molecular weight, and you've done uh, ultracentrifuge analysis and all that stuff. But IgE is, a, is a, an and the, anti the antibody that's responsible for de deriving allergy, okay? doesn't matter how it works, but what we know is that in patients that have asthma, they have an overreactive immune response to pollen grains, for example, or house dust mite or whatever it is, and therefore they go into bronchospasm, they have respiratory disease, and that's caused by an overreaction to uh, the, the allergen, the thing that causes the al allergy. Therefore, you want to treat these people by reducing their immune response to pollen grains and house dust mite. Whereas people have got cancer, they have antigens on the outside of the tumor cells, which we want to, one, identify, and two, enhance the immune response against, so that you go and kill your own cancer cells. Now, while you're sitting here, uh, you are all 
using a process known as immune surveillance. Every time a cell in your body divides, a single cell divides into two, your T cell system looks at it and sees if it's okay continually, all the way, and if it's not okay, it kills it. It's called immune surveillance, so you're killing tumor cells now while you sit here, and you've been killing tumor cells every day since you were born. Now, that is a feature of um, the, the T cell surveillance system. That when that system breaks down, that is the time, that is a time when tumors tend to take over. Now, people often wonder, what's the, um, what is the size of a tumor? that grows in the body that cannot be controlled by um, T-cell surveillance? And the answer is it's only about 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 cells, which is not very many cells at all, okay? So beyond that, you need to have an enhanced immune response. So it's quite simple for us, really. We're going to reduce the immune response um, uh, to get rid of asthma, and we're going to enhance immune responses to get rid of cancer. There are lots of non-specific ways of, of stimulating immune responses. I have to mention them to you. There's things called biological response modifiers. Uh, that means if you try and if you have a patient who is already um, developing an immune response, say to a tumor or to a virus or bacterial infection, you can non-specifically stimulate the immune response with various things. And these are few of them are listed here. Uh, the Coley's vaccine, nine, about 1900, that happened to. Steve had just finished his PhD then, and it was, um, it was, it was derived, designed to, to get antibodies to, to generate against streptococci and cephalococci infections in, in patients. And it was a um, rather complicated system, but what you were doing in this was to stimulate an immune response specific for that pathogen. How did you do that? Well, if you're a bacterium living on the surface of a cell, and you, underneath you is a load of pus and dead cells, it's very difficult for you to get through into the lower areas and for your immune system to see you. If you're a bacterium and you are three microns away from, uh, or three millimeters away from a mucosal surface, that's a long, long way. Okay, so these bacteria never got anywhere near the immune system. So this guy, Coley, took the pus and the mucus and everything else from these wounds on the outside of legs of, of people who had these terrible ulcers and he mashed it all up gently, centrifuged it lightly, it says in the paper, then he injected it into them. Okay. And those people that didn't die uh, actually stimulated a very strong immune response against Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. So that was a, a guy called Coley. Then there's other things as well, BCG and other strange things from goats. And I keep mentioning goats, and this will come up in this, the talk later on. So there are things you can do to immune response non-specifically. We're not in that game. We want to try and enhance immune response specifically for tumor cells. Now, here's one of those pictures that you might have seen from Marcus Olkosa when he did the immunity studies for you. But basically, don't bother learning this because we immunologists love these sort of slides. If, if Once you've learned it, we change it anyway. So this is a T helper cell. And Th1 cell, and this is a T helper cell type 2. These are T cells, thymus derived lymphocytes, that make cytokines, and cytokines are messages, chemical messages, interleukins. You probably remember those from Marcus's lectures. And you find that with um, Th1 cells, they make IL 2 and particularly something called interferon gamma, IFN gamma. And that cytokine stimulates these cells here to make what are called CTLs, that's cytotoxic T lymphocytes. It stimulates the white blood cells to make cells that will kill cancer cells, okay? These are cytotoxic T cells, and they kill cancer cells. It's quite different from the process with um, antibodies, which are stimulated by the Th2 helper cells, who make all these sorts of cytokines, including that one there, which is called transforming growth factor beta, don't bother what it is, but that particular uh, cytokine stimulates antibodies at mucosal surfaces, you know, in the gut, in the respiratory tract, etc. What they, this, these, cytok these um, helper cells stimulates these cytokines to make B cells, and you now we know what we're talking about, are B cells to make antibody. Okay, so we've got two arms of the immune response there that we can try and interfere with. If we're trying to kill free viruses or trying to kill um, 
or get rid of um, particular antigens, that's the way to do it with Th2 cells. Th1 cells stimulate cytotoxic T lymphocytes and they kill um, either virus infected cells but certainly tumor cells, okay? And these are the ones we want to work. Now, there's quite a lot of work going on in the immunotherapy of um, uh, lots of diseases, which I'm not going to go into. But I've given you a couple of references here, and if you'd like to follow them up, you can, but we're not going to talk about these in any detail. It's just to put it in context. Basically, cancer antigens are the, are the way ahead. And if you're going to go into this sort of research area, go into a large pharmaceutical company that's making monoclonal antibodies and doing therapy for cancer. That's where the interest is, that's where the excitement is, and probably that's where all the money is as well. And you're guaranteed of a permanent job because it's going to take us several decades to get rid of cancer. Don't worry about coronavirus. That'll be gone in six months to a year. We've all forgotten about it. Coronavirus is nothing. Cancer is, is the killer. So, so we're here to make that life easier. So it's useful in allergic disease, disease, we know that, and it's part of a standard cancer treatment, and because that has a potential to be used as a guided missile. Now you know that we mentioned earlier what a monoclonal antibody is. If you inject a monoclonal antibody into a patient, and that monoclonal antibody directly recognizes an antigen on the surface of a tumor cell, then that antibody goes there. It doesn't go anywhere else. So if you were to, um, say, use a, a chemotherapeutic drug, and you, always hear, you often hear the stories of these people who got cancer, and they have chemotherapy, and they have radiotherapy, and they have two of those things together, and it's really an appalling behavior process, and that the patient becomes very ill, and the hair falls out, and they feel ill. And the reason they feel ill is because you inject this um, drug intravenously, and the drug goes around the body, as soon as it gets to the liver, the liver recognizes it as being a toxin and detoxifies it, okay? So if the liver then spends a lot of energy detoxifying this drug, you've got to put more and more drug into this patient to get the therapeutic dose to where the tumor cell is. And that's why these people become very, very ill. However, if you had a monoclonal antibody that you knew would go specifically to the tumor, and you stuck a cytotoxic drug on the back, on the FC portion of the antibody, okay? If you put a drug, a cytotoxic drug on there and you injected that, that would go straight to the tumor and take the drug with it. And when that happens, you'll, you'll, you'll read about the fact that you can use 10% or less of the drug in vivo in that patient because the drug goes straight to the tumor cell, not through the liver and everything else. Okay? So that's a possibility. And we were working on this several years ago. And we were also uh, trying to investigate the possibility of attaching radioactive iodine, iodine-131, onto the back of a anti monoclonal antibody. Inject that intravenously, it goes straight to the tumor and gives you local, immediate radiotherapy at the site. Okay, so you don't have to blast the whole body with x-rays. You get radiotherapy at the site by using the monoclonal antibody. But none of those horses are mine, and none of those people are me. We're working here, lots of people have pictures of horses and animals and things, the spacer slides. And the first one's vaguely interesting, but we're bored with that now. And I'm bored with horses in general now in my life, so we, there won't be any more horse pictures, okay? We have much more interesting spacer slides coming up. We're going to talk about monoclonal antibodies in human medicine and some general ideas. What do we understand about monoclonal antibodies? that we have that have the potential for um, leading us into uh, positive therapy. Well, the first thing is that they've got very high target specificity. We talked about that before. That, that's what monoclonal antibodies do. They only recognize the antigen they've been stimulated against. But these antibodies are pretty big proteins. And you all know that the size of an antibody is 150 kilodontons, don't you? You know that. That's quite a big molecule. So 150 kD is a big antibodies to get around the body, to get around the whole body. So therefore the kinetics of distribution are slow and there's limited tissue penetration because there's a big molecule. And guess what? That's surprising. It depends upon the blood supply to get the tube, this antibody to go to where the solid tumor is. Okay, so all these things have to be uh, already in place. It's also dependent upon there being a high level of the target antigen 
expressed on that tumor cell. If this tumor cell doesn't have a lot of target antigen, the antibody isn't going to stick onto it. And also, because you'll know this from the earlier lectures you've had, it depends upon the isotype of the antibody. Is it an IgM, IgG, IgG123? Is it an IgE? Is it an IgA? So you need to know about the type of antibody that you want to develop. How do they work then? I'm going to give you lots of examples. Well, how do they actually do this? Actually, it's not completely known. There's lots of bystander effects. Basically, <clears throat> this antibody binds onto a tumor cell and then something happens. It's often it blocks the function of this target antigen. Now, if that target antigen is a metabolic antigen on the tumor cell, that's good news. It might kill the target cell specifically, directly. It might activate other systems that will kill the cell, and that's called, a system called complement. Never mind really what it is, but that's a system of uh, protein and uh, enzymes which will destroy cells that are activated at the surface. There could be a recruitment of other cells that do the job for you, like phagocytes, that's cells that eat other cells, uh, NK cells, for example, and I think Marcus Holgers might have mentioned NK cells to you. Or you might block or activate a receptor for intracellular signal transduction. There's a thing called NF-kappa B, which switches on after a cytokine called IL-8 activates a cell, and that is the early activation marker in a cascade of information. So you might say, well, let's just activate that, or let's just block that on the tumor cell. And you can take, transport, as we said before, toxins, drugs, and radioisotopes to the diseased tissue. There's problems, of course there are. These monoclonal antibodies that we just talked about, they're made in mice, that means they're foreign proteins. That means that the, the mouse FC fragment might not interact with the human FC receptor. That's the first thing. So you might get a reduced effective function of those monoclonal antibodies in vivo. Secondly, because it's a foreign protein, it's cleared quickly from the bloodstream. Your immune system sees this and says, wait a minute, I just had a load of mouse proteins in injected intravenously. We'd better get rid of that. And your immune system takes over and tries to get rid of it. And then so you develop what are called human anti-mouse antibodies, or HAMA. And that means that if you develop those, if you go back in again with a monoclonal antibody, say some weeks later in the same patient, that patient is going to be sensitized already to mouse proteins. And this patient might go to anaphylaxis, or might die, or might have a terrible shock reaction. And so it's very, very difficult to control that. Therefore, the second time in, you often have to give lots of drugs to these patients to stop them having a hyperreactive to it. However, this guy, De Nardo and that gang a long time ago, uh, described the fact that actually it's possible there may be a benefit to, uh, to Hammer on the, re the reason being that this non-specifically enhances immune response. Remember we said that before? There are lots of things that do that. They're called biological response modifiers. And they did a paper years and years ago showing that there was a little bit of benefit sometimes if you used uh, mouse antibodies in humans. And there's that paper, which you can read at your leisure. Well, these papers, you can click onto PubMed and see them. Uh, if, if that's not live, um, you can pick it up from the, the title. So <coughs> there are other problems as well. First of all, you might do the first injection and you get multiple systemic symptoms, chills, headaches, pyrexia, vomiting, diarrhea, heart problems. All these things can be a real problem. And that's happened, as you'd expect, with some of these monoclonal antibodies already. There's one called OKT3, which was an anti-CD3 marker. And this one made by a company in Cambridge called Campath. And that was an anti-CD52 thing that was used in patients. And they had became very, very ill as soon as you put this antibody into them. So they had to have lots of drugs to stop them feeling ill. These things, by the way, are reversible and not life-threatening. If you had the choice of being very ill for six months, having a monoclonal antibody therapy, but you're going to live for another five years or ten years, you'd probably be quite happy to accept that. And that is the, the thing. You have to balance up the um, the weight between benefit and cost for these things. The, the financial cost we don't care about. We're talking about the, the, the human cost to this. So the answer is really many of these therapies are not very nice at all, but the benefits are fantastic and it's worthwhile doing. So 
there's lots of ways of overcoming the problems with having a foreign protein stuck into you. One of them is to make a chimeric antibody, and you might probably know how that's done. That means the antigen binding part is still mouse, but the effector part, that's, that's the FC chain, is human. as a chimera. So that is not recognized so strongly as being a mouse antibody, okay? So you inject it intravenously into these patients and you get less of a, a shock reaction. Or you can humanize the, those antibodies, replace resident hypervariable region. You know what that is? That's in the FAB region, the hypervariable region, the antigen recognizing site. Replace that with new amino acids, which are human. Or well, the best way of all is this way, which is transgenic mice where human antibody gene loci have been inserted into the body of embryonic mice by stem cell transfer, then when you immunize these mice, they make antibody which is human because they've only got the genetic information to make human IgGs. Okay? So they make human IgG in, in, the, in this mouse. And there's also other, other sorts of mice. They're called knockout mice. They have um, anti some antibody genes uh, deleted and they have some cytokine genes deleted. So basically, transgenic mice is, is, is way ahead, I think, and lots of people have started this process. Then once you get these cells out of mice, you can grow them in culture forever. All right, so you need only do this mouse experiment about once or twice, get the cells, grow them in culture, and off you go. You have human-derived antibodies. So there's some problems for this. Uh, potential and transgenic mouse approaches are really great because you immunize a mouse with the antigen, it produces antibodies, and guess what? The antibody secreting cells produce all human antibodies, monoclonal. Very good. So in all these cases, there is a reduction in the immunogenicity, that's a reduction in the toxicity, if you like, of these antibodies in this order. So the mouse ones give you the most bad effects in patients, the chimeras give you less, humanized give you even less, and human antibodies give you the least. So there's a chain of, of, uh, of infl inflammation, if you like. Antibodies up here, lots of inflammation and bad side effects. Antibodies down here, low side effects. So somewhere in that line will be where we want to uh, develop our work. So we're going to talk about um, allergies first. We'll negotiate. We're supposed to go on until 12, aren't we? Now, you'll, be, you'll be fed up by 12. So what I thought we'd do is I'll finish stuff on allergies uh, and maybe a couple of introductory slides on cancer. Then if we take a five-minute break, and I just mean five minutes, literally, I'll finish in about 25 minutes, okay? You'd prefer that, wouldn't you? And um, if you were vets, I'd, I'd have to describe the clock to you and say, when big hand on 11, you come back. Because, but because you're a scientist, I can say, come back at 5 too, okay? Now, you, as you gather, I'm not a vet. So, um, I'm going to talk about, not all these, but just these two things, because that's what you want to know about. Allergic lung disease therapy, because that's the easy to describe and easy to treat, and cancer therapy, because that's exactly where the future is. I should say also that it's more than 25 now, it's about 40% of all biotech drugs in research and development are monoclonal antibodies. There's more than 30 of them in clinical evaluation now. Okay, It's a very powerful tool. <clears throat> These are papers to do with using um, monoclonal antibodies for other diseases. In this case, it's rheumatoid arthritis. We're not going to talk about that, but it's there for your interest. And if you want to read about it, you haven't got to read the whole thing. Look, you just read the bit in the square there and there as well. This is the new approaches to uh, curing respiratory syncytial viruses using monoclonal antibodies. So we're not going to bother with that. It's just there for your information. That's a spacer slide. That's a vendor Telecaster Custom. And it's um, very rare. And if you see any of those around anywhere, you send me an email and then I go and buy it. Okay. They, they, they are increasing in value at a remarkable amount. And that's much more interesting, and I think much more beautiful than a horse, isn't it? Right, so we're going to do monoclonal antibodies and allergic disease. It's pretty obvious how we could get rid of an allergy in a patient, because this patient is making IgE, immunoglobulin E, which binds onto mast cells, and when it binds onto the mast cells by the, F, 
epsilon receptor. The antigen binds onto it as well. It then changes its conformation. It triggers that cell to release histamine. Oh no, who needs that? So histamine is released into the circulation. You get bronchospasm, you get tightening of the bronchioles, you get wheezing chest, you get asthma, and if you're very, very bad with it, you die. So IgE binding to mast cells is critical in the pathogenesis of asthma. Now in children who have respiratory asthma, uh, this is very, very dangerous. And kids can sometimes just inhale or even eat, say, peanuts or something that they're allergic to, and they're straight on the floor within about two or three minutes, and you've got to get them to hospital quickly. So there's a real need to try and get rid of the IgE response. We like that as a way around it. Another way around it might be to make monoclonal antibodies to the cytokine that stimulates the recruitment of these inflammatory cells in asthma. And that has to be called interleukin-5, IL-5. doesn't matter what it is. It's a chemical, it's, it's a chemokine, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cytokine that binds onto these inflammatory cells and it activates them. So if we can stop these cells activating, we can stop IgE, we can stop histamine release, we can stop asthma. See how this goes? So maybe both of those will work, or maybe one's better than the other. The best one of all is, is uh, asthma therapy. Monoclonal antibodies made against human IgE, right? So that means you basically immunize mice with human IgE. And then you select these that bind to the FC epsilon R1 binding region. And then off you go. You're off. You then make monoclonal antibodies form the complexes with free IgE. So that means that you put the monoclonal antibody into the patient. The antibody recognizes free IgE, binds onto it. And what does it bind onto? It binds onto the FC epsilon R1 binding region of the antibody. And that antibody is then cleared from the system. And it's really rapid. You know, if, if, you, if you were to measure IgE in the bloodstream of a patient you're going to do this with, within about an hour to two hours, it's gone. Whoosh, straight out of the bloodstream. It's, it's really fantastic. You know. So it goes to the liver and it's, it's, it's excreted that way. However, there is a problem with allergic responses. And because it's cleared very quickly, you need to sort of make sure you do this at the right time. So it's best in acute disease. You've got patients that come in, they can't breathe, they're in bronchospasm, they're about to die, give them it net then. Their IgE levels go right down and they start to breathe again. It's really, really excellent. So that's a good potential. So uh, you do have to also worry, though, that this is a mouse monoclonal antibody. You can't keep doing this in these patients all the time because they develop very strong antibodies to mouse FC. So recombinant, humanized, and by humanized, you know what that means now, monoclonal antibody IgE has been made. It's called, they've all got strange names, but this one's called omalizumab. Who cares what it's called, but it's, it's um, you find they're all strange names. And this is a monoclonal antibody to human IgE that's been humanized by genetically um, modifying it. It's prepared and it's been used in vivo a lot and it clears free IgE from circulation. There's a dose-related sustained fall in plasma IgE. You get re reduced early bronchoconstriction, fantastic. So even though these patients are inhaling that allergen to which they are allergic, you can still reduce the lung constriction that way. And you also get some um, late responses as well. And you show there's a high reduction in high affinity IgE receptors on those basophils. So the whole thing is linked up together. These monoclonal antibodies are so good that really one treatment of that and you've cured the acute disease in that child or that adult, whoever it is, is very, very effective. And you couldn't do that before because those drugs that you had to give were, you know, were anti-inflammatory drugs which were uh, caused more damage to the rest of the body than they, they did benefit. There's a low, very low occurrence of adverse side reactions. Why? Because this is a humanized antibody. All right? It's not a mouse one, it's not a chimera, it's humanized. It's got replacement of the hypervariable regions sequences with human amino acids. Those immune complexes are cleared very quickly, and although it's expensive, and who cares really, only 5% of the allergic patients after that have severe asthma. If you think of the alternatives, which are all these here, uh, this is actually quite acceptable. There's a paper by Holgate 
uh, in 2005, which is a, sort of the best review on that. If you wanted to read about it, I think it should be there. Yeah, there's, that's his paper on that, which reviews the anti-IGE response. So what about using this, instead of killing IgE, why don't we try and kill um, or get rid of the cytokine that stimulates the inflammatory cells that cause cells to release IgE? So this make a monoclonal antibody to IL-5. It's, it's linked very closely to eosinophils. These are cells that migrate to sites of allergy activity in the lung. So it's an eosinophilic inflammation cascade modifier. If you delete the gene from that, you can you can do a fantastic amount of work. So they made monoclonal antibodies uh, against IL-5, and it lasted quite well, about three months or so when they did it in animal studies. And so the thought was, well, if it lasts for three months, not like the one before, which I remember it was acute, you inject it into the patients and they start to breathe again. This lasts for about three months. And they thought, well, we'll try, we'll try this, and we've done it in, in, uh, in primates. So they made a humanized anti-IL-5 monoclonal, and that's called, oh goodness, uh, mepolizumab, who cares what it's called. And that reduced blood eosinophils by 95%. That was pretty good, and this lasts three months. We like that. But in the lung, it hardly did anything. It just reduced it by 50%. And why is that? Because those eosinophils that cause lung inflammation are in the interstitial spaces. They're in the bit between the blood supply and the oxygen supply. It's called the interstitium. They are in the tissue of the lung. So you can't get these antibodies here because, as we said before, they're big molecules. They're 150 kilodaltons. There's no way they're going to get into the interstitium. So there's a bit of a problem there. So I just say needs no more work. So when you get your MSc and you go off and work for a big company, you can work on IL-5 monoclonals to see if we can improve it because there's a big need for that. And there's a review on uh, IL-5 and anti-IgE, which is 2016, and that's from a good group. And uh, there's also a link here, which is, should be live. If you copy that link, there's a video uh, telling about monoclonal antibodies in the se severe asthma by Peter Walk. And um, it's more or less everything you'd need to know about uh, monoclonal antibodies currently in asthma therapy. And this, this guy's in Australia. That's a Gibson SG standard. Now, the thing about that is um, that tells us we're moving into cancer now. We've finished asthma, so we've got the news about asthma. Acute asthma, get rid of the IgE with a monoclonal antibody to the FC epsilon part of IgE. Or get rid of IL-5, which is a cytokine that recruits these um, inflammatory cells to the tissue. Both of those are functional. First one is very, very quick and rapid and more or less cures these people straight away. It doesn't last very long. The other one lasts about three or four months. It's quite good, but it's not as good as that one. Okay, so there needs to be a bit more work on it. Now, the thing about that guitar is, um, I've got a few of these, but that's, you probably hadn't even bothered to notice that the, that piece is not the same height as that, so they're asymmetric. So Gibson SG standards are asymmetric. They don't have symmetrical binding. Why am I telling you that? Well, the reason is because this side here is where you, your hand is, and that's to give you fingerboard access. Okay. Now, you might say, well, why on earth have you told us that? I've told you that because now you know it, you will never, ever forget it. <laughs> so when you're my age, not, not as old as Steve, but when you get my age, someone will say, Gibson SG standard, you can say, Asymmetric horns, isn't it? Oh, fingerboard access, yeah, I know about that. It's in your mind now, and you haven't learned it. It's just something you've picked up. And this happened to me when I was a student, even I was a student, and there was, there was, it was in an embryology lecture, and this guy said, um, make a mark on the pen. We used to use pens, remember those? You don't use pens, but you, you put, make a mark on the pen on your page and write down, there is a cytoplasmic control of oocyte function in oocytes. Uh, in frog oocytes. So I wrote that down. Now I've just repeated it, and that was, you can tell you now, it was several decades ago, and it is in there. I've no idea if I've ever used it again in my life, but I know that information is there. The human brain is a strange thing. So Gibson SG standards, we know all about that. Could have gone to cancer. 
and I'm going to be able to finish in about 25 minutes. So what, I, what I'd like to suggest to you, if you're keen on this, would be to, um, it's now 5-2 on there, we'll use that clock. Why don't we get back again at 2 minutes past 12? Okay. That's when big hand is between 12 and 1. Okay. And we'll go straight in and we'll do cancer. And I've got, two, well, three really, three really exciting things to tell you about cancer. And I, what I want you all to do is to, is to go and do PhDs and then work in the pharmaceutical industry doing monoclonal antibodies to cancer therapy. That's where the future is. And that's where the money's going to be. Okay. See you when big hand is between 12 and 1. Okay. Thanks.
Okay, welcome back. We're, going to, we're now going to cover um, monoclonal antibodies in cancer therapy. And I think there are about three areas you want to talk about, but there's been really great advances in this now. And I think it's, it's fantastic the way the developments have been made. And what is interesting, by the way, is that um, so, some of the work that was done here at Nottingham at the uh, Queen's Medical Center um, by Lindy Durrant and her group, uh, and the group that I was in when I did be postdoc, have led to some of these fantastic uh, discoveries. So Nottingham plays a good role in this, so that's positive. So we've talked about the design of monoclonal antibodies, how they're made. We know about cytotoxic agent conjugates. We mentioned sticking those on the monoclonal antibodies. We mentioned that the pharmacokinetics of monoclonal antibodies is very, very slow because they are big molecules. They don't get around the body very quickly because they're 150 kilodaltons, so they don't get very quickly. But when they do go there, you don't need as much as you would with the drugs. Um, we know that we have a problem because these are foreign proteins made in mice and may be modified a bit, but they're still foreign proteins, and you're going to inject them intravenously into a patient that already has cancer. Okay, so lots of things to think about there, but that's a summary of where we are. So why don't we move forwards and, and get some good news about it. We're going to talk about lymphoma. You may have heard of lymphomas. Uh, there's there's non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, Hodgkin's lymphomas, and a few other things. When, when I was a young lad, even I was young, and when I was young, um, they were kids. Um, when I was about 15, I went to three funerals of kids who died of lymphomas. Uh, when, they, when they died, we were about between the age of five and 12, because childhood le uh, le leukemia was not common, but it was uh, something that was a big worry. Now, no children die of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. None. That's a great advance on that. We're going to talk about lymphomas. We're going to talk about cancer as a 
using um, monoclonal antibodies as a vaccine using what are called anti-idiotype monoclonal antibodies. Now you, you don't you probably don't know what an anti-idiotype is, do you? I'll assume no. And I'm going to summarise what they are quickly. And then we're going to talk about HER2, which is the um, human epithelial receptor, which has now become a big news for breast cancer therapy. Okay. Right, lymphoma therapy with monoclonal antibodies. Now, they were called LIM1 and LIM2. It doesn't matter what they are. But basically, these monoclonal antibodies were made by immunizing uh, mice with uh, tumor cell nuclei. And then you, re you get the, the antibodies out and you test them um, in, uh, in vitro, and there's a binding region on the genetic code on the outside of tumor cells called an HLA-DR. I'm not too worried, you might not know what that is, but that is a marker on the surface of human cells. And this HLA-DR10 is particularly the ones that is recognized. You select lymphoma cells on the basis of that, and then is, there's more notes about it in resources, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the, the one that's commonly developed and is in use almost everywhere is called rituximab. And if you know anybody who's having monoclonal antibody therapy for tumors, they've probably taken rituximab as well. It's excellent. It's used very effectively for lymphomas and some autoimmune diseases. The target antigen is an antigen called CD20. <clears throat> CD markers are surface glycoproteins on mammalian cells that have a specific uh, configuration, and indeed there's many, many of them. And they're called cluster differentiation markers, CD, and this particular one is called CD20. It doesn't matter what it does, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about it in, in a little more detail in a minute. It's an activation marker. Okay, that's the first thing you need to know. And it's on normal cells and on lymphoma cells. So it's on tumor cells and, and it's also on normal cells. But it has an increased surface density on tumor cells. So this is given as our answer to the question. Yes, we've got a marker on a tumor cell. Yeah, okay, it's in normal cells as well but we've got a monoclonal antibody to it. So we're going to start killing some normal cells as well, which you've got CD20 on, but the majority of CD20 positive cells will be lymphoma cells, i.e. tumor cells. So the, the, this particular antibody is a chimeric one. That means it's a mouse antibody where you have substituted uh, human um, segments into it. It's an IgG1, and there's now new new smart versions are coming out which are humanized that means they've even got human amino acid sequences in the FAB region and there's also other generation antibodies which have got things done to the gamma end so it's get things there's been some genetic modifications of the FC region as well so that so this antibody has been messed about with quite a lot but it's now what a long way down the line but this is a great news. It significantly improves survival and welfare of lymphoma patients. And yes, it does. I've seen loads of success with this. It binds to CD20, transmits intracellular signals which lead to apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. So what happens is that the monoclonal antibody binds onto the CD20 that triggers a cascade which sends the cell into a death um, cascade so the cells just move on and die it's absolutely brilliant and uh, it's most commonly used monoclonal antibody now in lymphomas it's excellent so the clinical use just for interest you if you interested this this the stuff is called rituxan and that's the dose you give per body surface area the body surface area of most humans is about two square meters by the way you need to have pre-meds pre -meds in these people, that's pre-medications, that's paracetamol, hydrocortisone and pyroton. Why? And I was going to ask you when we have a discussion, but we want to get going soon. The answer is because we don't want this patient to go into an allergic response because this patient's going to get some mouse antibodies into its bloodstream. So we reduce the inflammatory response by giving them paracetamol, hydrocortisone and pyroton. Pyroton is an anti-allergen um, chemical which I'm sure you've heard of. You then intravenously infuse it at that dose 
over about five hours or so. And you can get some hypersensitivity reactions, but you can control these. Often the blood pressure doesn't go up or down. It goes up and then it goes down, and then it goes up and then it goes down. It's very difficult to maintain, so you need to stabilize blood pressure. That's quite easy to do with current drugs. This happens then for about five hours. You send the patient away, come back in five weeks, do it again, do that three to four times, and their tumor disappears. It's gone. A significant benefit for 6 to 24 months in most patients. Some of them have been going on for 10, 15 years without any further intervention. So it's a, it's a CD20 positive lymphoma therapy with rituximab. There's loads of people doing this sort of work. There's a paper there. Um, there's another one that's been developed called I don't know why they do this. Ofatumumab. Right. It's a CD20 as well. Phew. Right. That's right. And there's lots of other new monoclonal antibodies. And that's you can read about that in that journal. There's also a review uh, of um, treatment of leukemia with various combinations of these antibodies in the next slide. So if you look at that paper there, you'll see that there's a current treatment of chronic lymphocytic le leukemias that include lymphomas, leukemias, acute myeloid leukemias, acute lymphocytic leukemias, and a few others. So that's a pretty effective paper to read if you're interested in this area. So that's a success story, isn't it? Rituximab is great. Uh, it's an anti-CT20, and they sh they've shown now, as you'd expect, it's got other effects in it as well. And guess what? You can find that this it actually relieves chronic fatigue, a thing called chronic fatigue syndrome. Basically, if you think of anything where an overreactive B cell which is, in this case is a tumour, if you've got something that's concerned with an, an, an overreactive, not necessary but possibly harmful B cell activity, you can switch that off with an anti-CD20 monoclonal because it, CD20 is on activated B cells. So it, it works for quite a few other diseases as well, although not so good. But it does wipe out most of the body's B cells and that's how the system works. If you give somebody a very high dose of rituximab <coughs> in hospital, and if you clear all their white blood cells out there, have got CD20 on them, you need to do something because this person, patient now hasn't got an immune system. So what happens with uh, colleagues of mine that, um, that, that I know about, they've had some uh, white blood cells taken out of them, put into uh, liquid nitrogen and stored, then they've been given this treatment. And then when they're ready, they then grow these cells up in culture that they're in store from liquid nitrogen and then introduce them back into the blood system. So they regenerate their immune system again. And somebody here might say, well, aren't you going to put tumor cells back into that patient then? No, because in culture, you have rituximab that kills the lymphoma cells in culture. So when you put these cells back into the patient, there aren't any tumor cells there. You're just regenerating their immune response. Excellent. There's recent papers there on use in chronic fatigue syndrome as well. You may be interested in that. Right, here we go. This is the exciting bit, which is so, so far then we've been using monoclonal antibodies in lymphomas. And somebody might say, yeah, well, why is this so good in lymphomas? Answer, because they're dead easy to get to. Lymphomas are tumors of B cells in the bloodstream, all right? So they're easy to access. They're in the bloodstream already. It's the tumours that aren't in the bloodstream that causes a problem. Breast cancer, colon carcinoma, lung cancer, bone cancer, bladder. These are things where the tumour is maybe a solid tumour and it's difficult to get at it. And moreover, the blood supply to that tumour might not be very good. So we may have to rely on not just the monoclonal antibody doing the work for us, but maybe we can use something to stimulate an immune response specifically so that the patient kills his or her own tumor, okay? So stimulating the immune response in the cancer patient against their own tumor. Now, to use this system, a system was developed using what are called anti-idiotypic antibodies. Now, I'm just gonna summarize what they are. And if you're interested, you can read up I'll put you some resources on here and give you a about it. Basically, this is an antibody with this FAB region. It binds onto an antigen, okay? So you make an antibody to that. That's antibody one. You take this antibody, chop it there, 
immunize another animal with that one and they make an antibody to that. Okay. They're called antibody 2s or anti-idiotypic antibody because it's against the idiotype of the person, the genetic type of the person or the animal from which you've taken this antibody. And that anti-idiotypic antibody, which recognizes the inside of antibody 1, all right, functions as antigen. You must say, well, wait a minute, how does that work? But if you think about it, antibody there, into that one, take that off, cut it, immunize with that, you make antibodies to all this surface, those antibodies to that surface take on the function of that. How do we know this works? As an example, if you immunize mice against estrogen, okay, oh, male, a male mouse, you immunize male mice against estrogen, they make mouse anti-estrogen. Well, that's, that's easy stuff, we understand that. If we take that mouse anti-estrogen antibody and immunize other mice with it, they make a mouse anti-mouse anti-estrogen. Okay, so antibody two in that mouse. So estrogen, antibody one, take that job, immunize with that, you get antibodies to that. That's an anti-anti-antibody, it's called an anti-idiotype. If you inject that antibody that you just made into a female mouse, it goes into estrus because it thinks it's been injected with estrogen. Right? So anti-idiotypic antibodies function as antigen. That's the news I want you to get hold of straight up. Just like guitars, I want you to understand that bit. So anti-idiotypic antibodies function as antigen. Therefore, if you can make an anti-idiotypic antibody, you can use that as a vaccine. And it'll be a vaccine against your tumour. Get the idea? So we can take antibodies from or antibodies secreting cells from you, recognize antigens you're interested in on tumor cells, make antibody twos from that, screen them, test them against cells in culture, and then you end up with something that's basically a vaccine. And you don't need to know what that surface structure of that antigen was on the tumor cell. You don't even need to know that. Your immune system has worked out what that is. And you're now growing in culture an anti-idiotypic antibody which is functioning as antigen. So it's a tumour vaccine. So you can make some notes about it there if you wanted to. This is where it comes and I use estrogen as an example. And now the great news about that was there's an anti-idiotypic antibody from colorectal cancer in Nottingham. I'm not going to go into great detail because the next slide does that. You can read it if you want to, but it covers everything about this antibody. Basically, it's a human monoclonal anti-idiotypic antibody, called that, which mimics an antigen on the surface, a tumour-associated antigen called CD55 on colorectal cancer cells. Okay, so this is done as follows. Antibody to CD55. Off. Took. Fuse. Clone. Immunise mice with that. They make antibody to that, which is the same as that. So that you make in vitro an anti-idiotypic antibody which functions as CD55. Therefore, <clears throat> you can make CD55 vaccine, inject it into patients, that, and they will make an antibody response to CD55. Okay, it's, it's, it's relatively simple, but it just sounds complicated to explain it. But when you think about it, this is a really powerful tool. It stimulates anti-tumor T-cell responses as well, and, and this, well, it's fantastic, right? So it's sequencing that CD55 um, thing shows that it's present in patients with got all these uh, genetic types, and they are about 70% of the population have got that. So this is a really interesting thing. This slide here gives a theory behind all that. I'm not going to go through it now. There's some references there, and it came from um, the Lindy Durrant, is she on there somewhere? Yeah, Lindy Durrant's group who worked at, um, at Nottingham um, Cancer Lab. And it tells you how that monoclonal antibody is derived. But all you need to know is that, that is an anti-idiotypic antibody functions as antigen. Therefore, you can use it in cancer vaccines. 
clearly. Therefore, CD55 mimic as it is now, this is an antibody. It's not CD55, it's an antibody to an antibody to it. It's used as a vaccine, colorectal cancer, there it is. That was quite a long time ago, though, 2006. 83% of the patients responded, 83% of patients that had that particular genetic makeup responded to this vaccine. But about the same number of patients did not respond to it if they didn't carry this genetic marker. So all we did was make antidiotypes that recognize that other type of HLA as well. So that's how it was progressed. And then a company called Onivax started that in 2000. And there's a few references there. So the take home message is anti idiotypic antibodies function as antigen. By doing that, we can make a vaccine that is a mimic of a marker on a tumor cell called CD55. Therefore, we can immunize with CD55 into a patient. It makes his own immune response to CD55 and kills his own or her own tumor cells. Brilliant. So, what we're doing is we're instructing the immune response to do its job and redirecting it to be specific to CD55 in this case. And there's some general stuff about Onifax, and I'm not going to read all that either. This review of that antibody and how it's been used. You can see it's quite old review, it's 2002, um, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it will lead you into that. If you just look at Maxwell Armstrong's lot and Lindy Durant's lot, just follow them up in PubMed, you'll see what the recent papers are from them good progress in osteosarcoma as well. So it's not just in colon carcinoma. We did the same in osteos. Uh, it, you find that this has a lot of application. And the reason why it will work with osteosarcoma and the colon carcinoma is because CD55 is on the same cells. It's the same activation marker on tumor cells. Right, easy. Right, there's another review. I'll just give you a little review to look at. So Lindy Durant, LG Durant, is the one to take note of because she is now from the company at Nottingham called ScanCell. And ScanCell makes what are called immunobodies. What they're doing is a new immune response system where they are modifying antibodies just as we described, but they're also sticking onto them T cell activation markers. Right. Remember what I said before? that T cells, you're doing it now, are kill cells which are abnormal. If you activate T cells, there's something they have to see. Let's put this activation marker on the CD55 molecule, inject it into patients, and then you find that they stimulate their T cell responses. And guess what? You get recruitment of T cells which kill tumor cells in vivo. It all works. I mean, I'm making this sound very exciting. There are problems with it, but you can see the technology is, is rather simple. We're making a cancer vaccine based on a CD marker. We're then using an anti-idiotypic antibody for that, and we're modifying the end of that antibody to have a T-cell receptor molecule on it. So when it binds onto a tumor cell, it attracts cytotoxic T-cells to it, and they kill the tumor cell. This is a very, it's a neat system, and they're called, uh, that company is called ScanCell, and they're at the Queen's Medical Center. There's a next slide now shows the concept derivation of it, which I'm not going to go into, but they're engineered to contain T cell epitopes, which will switch on cytotoxic T cells, which will kill the patient's own tumor cells. And that's the paper. And Lindy, Lindy Durant is the senior author on that. And that's a pretty good review, actually. Um, antibodies designed as effective cancer vaccines. That's probably, of all things today, that's it. Well, it's a Tennessean. They're a bit rare as well. And the other thing about Tennesseans are, we must be moving on to another area now, is that the dots look are not in the middle of the neck, they're on the edge of the neck there. They're quite rare. Recognise those and send me an email. Thank you. I'm now going to move on to breast cancer. A big problem, and because it's a solid tumour, it's very, very difficult to control. And you may have people who have major surgery and remove all lymph nodes and everything, and then they undergo uh, some treatment, and you don't know if there are tumor cells anywhere else in the body because you can't see them, and so you whack them with x-rays and you whack them with chemicals, and they feel terribly ill and the hair falls out and everything else, and everybody is very, very distressed about it. 
So the step forward was to try and identify something on breast cancer cells which was unique, which the immune system could uh, recognize. And there was this human epidermal growth factor receptor number two, called HER2. Now, that's not an unusual receptor. It's common in um, these, these RB proteins are all, all in there. Uh, um, in, fetal cells, if you like, or in, in development of cells into other organs. So in embryology, these cells are very common. They're, more, they're commonly known as epidermal growth factors, and HER2 is also called now CD340. Remember we talked about CD55 and CD20? Well, we're, look, this is CD340. There's a lot of these things around. It's also known as protein 185. So HER2 is something that's an epidermal growth factor receptor on tumor cells, right? You can see how we're all thinking now, can't you? Because immediately you, they're thinking, ah, here's a future monoclonal antibodies to HER2 and then make a mimic to it for a vaccine. It's a tumor-associated antigen. It's normally present in normal embryonic development. In adult life, it's overexpressed by malignant cells, and particularly in these tumors here. Right, so right, 15% of invasive breast cancers have HER2 overexpression on it. It's Overexpression of HER2 is correlated with a greater tumor aggressiveness, increased risk of recurrence, and poor prognosis. So patients who got breast cancer, whose tumor cells are HER2 positive, have a rather poor prognosis, and they have to be considered for this sort of treatment. So up till now, they've all been, they've all been having estrogen therapy and chemotherapy and things like that. This is now a whole new approach to stimulate, or well, it's old now, but it was a new approach stimulating specific immune response than breast cancer cells. So since it's overexpressed at the cell surface, the tumor cells, it's a good target for anti-cancer therapy. So the, the, in fact, it's ideal. The hypothesis is that if you generate anti, anti-HER2 immune responses, you should be able to protect patients from uh, that have overexpressed cells. And the one called, here we go, Trastuzumab. That one right. is a monoclonal antibody that's been used for anti-HER2 immunotherapy. Induce, this, is a, this is a hot news because it was only a few years ago you couldn't say this sort of thing. Induction of a stable and strong immunity by this and other cancer vaccines proposed to lead this establishment of immune memory so it prevents tumor recurrence. However, because HER2 is a normal receptor, okay, on normal cells, you're going to have some trouble because you're either going to kill off normal cells as well, which you don't mind doing if you can cope with that and regenerate them. But it's also a possibility that you might develop some immunological tolerance because these, these uh, receptors are continually being recycled on tumor cells. So you might, the immune system might say, well, I've had enough of this then. Uh, this, it's not going to work. I'll just become immune. I'll become tolerant of these, uh, these antigens. But if you do it right and do it with the right combination of other monoclonals, it works a treat. And you'll see here the current challenge is, is make vaccines from that. There's several of them around. And HER2 vaccines have included tumor cells and cells, recombinant HER2, and antiidotypes. Antiidotypic antibodies mimicking HER2. So you've, you've heard all this before now. CD55 now, HER2, there must be something else. Yes, the answer is yes. That is the way ahead for these uh, <coughs> monoclonal antibody generations. There's a free access review. You can read about it. I think you'd be really impressed with the way this has gone from in relative, it, it was since about 2010 or thereabouts. So it's only about 10 years this work's really taken off. And there's another one there. There's another review uh, targeting that growth factor. More reviews in 25. I've just given you reviews here because you're, you're postgraduates and you might say, well, I want to have a look at that. There they are. You can do so. The most recent one I've got is a review on molecular mechanisms using translational therapies. And that is a really good paper by this, this group. Um, and they've, they've shown, um, <clears throat> this is a, Ch a Chinese group who've, who've actually looked at translational therapies. That means ju not just making um, her two things, but doing doing some work on the molecular mechanism of antibody escapes for these tumors, and then selecting the gene products, and then using those in monoclonal therapy. Really clever stuff. Uh, the paper that, that was just accepted when I put that in last year, but it's now published, 
um, which is a safety and efficacy of first-line monoclonal antibody. This is a new one called Pertuzumab. We talked about Trastumuzab, didn't we, a little while ago. Uh, so these are all HER2 positive treatment therapy. These things were not around five, ten years ago. It's brilliant the way these are going. And this is the industry to be in. But here we go, that's, that's the end of that. So we're changing now, and you know what that is. And um, do a quick check for learning. So we're nearly finished now. We're going to do some resources. The check for learning is what we always do is try and sort of find out if you picked anything up from this. So I asked you to get something and then you shout an answer out. Um, are the the horns on a Gibson SG standard symmetrical? No. Why is that? Fingerboard access, thank you. What's the cytokine responsible for stimulating cytotoxic T cells? Silence. I said it four times. I specifically said it four times so I could say this to you. It's interferon gamma, and I've said it four times, they, that's the cytokine that switches on those cells to kill tumor cells. Okay, and that's an interesting check for learning, because you picked up the guitar thing very easily, I knew you would, and I knew there'd be a bit of blank faces when I asked for a cytokine. And that if I asked for other things as well, you might not get, what's the, um, the target for um, the monoclonal antibody in lymphomas? It's called rituximab, what's it called? CD20, they are. That's good. We've got some answers. That's good. Thank you for that. <laughs> right. Now, we, if we had time for a long chat about it and, um, and we were going to go to the coffee bar, we could talk about this. How we deliver biological response modifiers and some risks. There are lots of ways around this, but it's interesting to discuss because actually the technology behind this has been rather simple, I think you'll find. We talked about an antibody molecule, we talked about making a monoclonal antibody, we talked about modifying it, and we also talked about making uh, anti-idiotypic antibodies to function as a vaccine. We know what are on the surface of some tumour cells, and we can kill them with these monoclonal antibodies. This is a big step forward. So resources. I made uh, Steve buy this. The monoclonal antibody index came out in 2012. There's a new one out in 2017. So you can say to him, Steve, can we have a look at this, please? And he'll say, I haven't kept it up. That's what he'll say. He said he hasn't paid for it every year. Anyway, they have a new edition in 2013, another one in 2017, and they've got a vaccine antigen index and a whole load of things. What's important is there's more than 9,000 antibodies on there, 9,000 monoclonal antibodies. We've only talked about four of them uh, in 2012. There's, there's too many to talk about now. That's the address at the bottom there. This is how it works. So you go on to the monoclonal antibody index, and we're going to look at LIM1 because we talked about that. That was called rituximab, remember? And it's used for treating lymphomas. Along here, you just go on the table and it says LIM1, that's what it is. It tells you what, the, what it's related to. It's related to these ones. The species is a mouse. The type of antibody is an IgG2A. That's its characteristics. The target cell is a B lymphocyte. The target cancer is used as lymphoma. It tells you about the molecular weight of the um, uh, of the of the peptide binder of, of its, its target, what the antigen epitope is, the study phase it's in, and also what, who has the patterns for this. So we say, well, I like that one. I'm interested in that antibody. I've only done one on here, by the way, just to show you how it works. You then click on where it says bibliography, and up comes this, which is the references and the production characteristics of that antibody only. There's about, there's about 30 of these. There's no end of papers on diagnostic and therapeutic use of that one antibody. And there's several thousand of them, okay? So if you ever want any resources to get into, that's the one to be on. There's some monoclonal antibodies that are currently mentioned today. And I just want to run through them just to list them there because they're the ones. And the ones that you that we talked about in particular are OKT3, we talked about um, rituximab, binds on CD20, we talked about Herceptin, binds on HER2, we talked about some of these other ones, Asumumab, which is used for CD52 and white blood cells, there's a few others as well, and some that are used to stop angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the formation of blood vessels. If you're a tumour, all you want is glucose and oxygen, you don't care about anything else, right? And and the way to do that is to be near a blood system. 
If you haven't got a blood system, then tumours secrete angiogenesis factors, which cause, promote the growth of little blood vessels inside tumours. And there you are. Thank you very much. We've got our glucose, we've got our oxygen, we can carry on quite happily. If you can stop angiogenesis, stop the development of blood vessels inside tumour cells, they'll, they will die. So that's a good way. So there's quite a lot of antibodies around which will do, which will stop angiogenesis. There's a thing about that antibody before. Um, it's a derivation of it. So that's the same slide that appears somewhere else. And that's as a resource. So that's the end of all that. There is a picture of horses at the end after all. Okay. So what, what I've got for you this afternoon or this morning, or still in the morning, is we know how... It's easy, really, to do antibodies to IgE and allergies and things. The tumour one's a bit more exciting, but, but now we're starting to identify antigens on the surface of tumour cells that are important to tumour cell survival. We can make antibodies to them. If our monoclonal is not very good at killing tumour cells, we take with it some, seed, some T cell epitopes so that we attract cytotoxic T cells to the tumour and you kill your own tumour. These ladies are having HER2 receptor things with the... Um, T cell epitope molecules on them are killing tumor cells extremely efficiently. So that's the way ahead. Hope you enjoyed that. I uh, hope you all do well in your exams. I hope you all do PhDs in cancer therapy. And I hope you'll make a lot of money. Okay, thank you. Good luck. because they're related to the sports and um, I was a little bit confused which ones I mean there's a pre preference towards IG1 and 3 in cancer therapies I feel and then yes there is and I because they activate the FCR wise uh, exactly right and, and they activate continent and everything else yeah, they yeah, usually, yeah. They usually because they one. affect her mm -hmm. in, in GC yeah. yep. and because you didn't mention IG4 when you mentioned IGs in general I was like they are used but I didn't really find too much information. No, there isn't. Uh, but the thing is, the trouble is that they, they, a lot of work was done on those other types, including M's and A's, mm. because, to be honest, I've done it myself. You start cloning these things and they keep coming up. The cells mm. that survive are the ones that are making RGA or are making RGG2 or RGG4, you don't want them. So there were lots of them around. People who didn't want to just chuck them in the bin, so they kept them and see if they would work. But those RGGs that, that are not IgG1s and not, not IgG4s, they are often good because they will still target the cell. They won't do much when they get there, but they can take other things out. Mm -hmm. In particular, Lind Lindy Durrance things, they take um, the uh, T cell epitopes. Mm -hmm modified to do that. So although it might not be a very functional antibody, as we all say, oh well, great, we want to buy an FC receptor and, and then and then give it a compliment and then kill the cell. Yes. But if you get the antibody there, you can do other things with it. You can take those two cell episodes with it. So different approaches either activating the immune response or yeah. kill structure. Yeah that's right. So you you, no, you can some of these monoclonal are pretty good at killing tumor cells themselves in vitro. You can do that. But 
they're not so good at it as the human body is. But uh, basically what you want to do is try and get these cells to be killed by a combination of that antibody binding onto them and then the immune system recognizes that. The, which one is the thing that's you can use? And you choose the antibody based on which is the best. Like everybody is dangerous. Sorry, sorry, what? Is it IGF-4 you're talking about? Well, it, or any, 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 any of them. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. So if, if you want an antibody that's going to do a lot of cytotoxicity, then there's certain sub-isotypes you would do. But if you've got any antibody that will specifically target that tumor cell, you can modify it to put T-cell epitopes on. That's what Lindy Durant's done. And that's what the immuno cell is all about. So, so really, it, it, the sub-isotype or the isotype of the antibody molecule itself, uh, it often it doesn't matter too much. As long as you get the antibody. What we want to do is get the antibody there. Into the tumor cell, then we can start worrying about it. If it's not very effective and it doesn't activate movement, no. But it might take T cell epitope. Which one is the first one? I mean, basically, which, I mean, the whole thing is you want to get the human to start making an immune response that kills the wrong tumor cells. That's what you're after. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so. And with the IgG3, because it has a variable region in terms of engineering, is it always less preferred? Or, I mean, it's used quite widely, but uh, yeah. because of this variable region, they always engineer it or they use it as it is because it causes a lot of problems. Industrial? Mainly because it goes a lot of the problems. A lot, a lot of the engineered uh, molecules, they only found out okay. how to That's reduce the these, the, these problems just by trial and error, which has been a bit of a mess. And this is why it's taken so long to get all these things. Okay, okay. This is why they're really excited with anti types. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't have to know yeah, anything. Yeah. Really, yeah. 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 Get on with it, and it, shove it in, and it works. But when it comes to the chemistry, well, that, this is not my area. So there are other people who can ask all that about how you modify these molecules. Do that. I just know that it's done, and I get it, and shove it in. But in general, it's done, and you're not sure how they modify them. Yeah, yeah. It, in general, the, 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 the chimera is. Or, or, uh, well, you, as I said before, you, the humanized ones where we replace the amino acids of the uh, hypervariable region with human ones. That's quite easy to do. Um, or you can make uh, an up to the same hybrid hybrids or chimera molecules, which are actually two, two antibodies type stuck together. But let's see different targets. Mm. Yeah, the, I mean, the, what you're after, I don't care what it, it hasn't even got to be an antibody. I've, yes. I've used phage as well, bacteriophage, to do the same thing. As long as you see your target, then you can target it specifically. Mm. Um, you, you've got something to work with. So that's, that's basically, you know, this is sort of an introduction to the area, but all these papers are described in detail. Yeah. Okay, but in general? No, in general, but I hope that, that was sort of generally valuable. And the thing about it is, you know, as you're doing this course, there's only one bit of it. You've got a whole lot of other things as well in this course. So yeah, yeah, I know. But, that's yeah. It, but this is the exciting bit, though. I hope you think that sort of thing is exciting. I think mm -hmm. you want to go into that research area. Yeah, that's one of the modules that I am interested in. Yeah, no, I think that's a great area to be in. I mean, it's, it, it, you're never going to be out of a job. You know, this can be continuous. And then to use monoclonal antibodies as anti idiotypes as vaccines. What a future that is. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, there's yeah. lots of possibilities. Yeah, well, good luck then. <laughs>